Baruch atah Adonai Elohim Melech Olam, Shehechiyano v'kihimano v'higiyano l'azman hazeh. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, who has kept us alive and sustained us and enabled us to reach this moment. Guys, every moment is a gift from God. Not every day, every moment. And wouldn't it be wonderful if you took many of those moments and thank God? Um, it would change your life. Happy Passover, guys. Happy Passover. Um, let me also um, bless your children, okay? If they're sitting with you or not with you, I just want to bless them. If they're near you, put your hand on their head, will you please? Um, wherever you may be. And um, Father, I want to pray. Um, over the children because you told me to. And just like um, Yeshua brought the children close to me, he said, don't suffer the children, bring them to me. He had a real heart for children. And uh, Father, most of them are very young and very innocent and in some ways a little clueless. And that's why we as parents are supposed to train them and teach them and warn them and bless them and not everybody has that opportunity, Father. Not every child is born into a household like this. So, Father, I want to pray and ask you to supernaturally watch them and guide them and infuse them with your love. Supernaturally protect them and let them know that there's nothing better than obeying you. There's no way that you can hide in the shadow of God's wings except through obedience. So, Father, may they obey you so you can hide them and protect them from the enemy and all his strategies and schisms. I pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. We are in the season of miracles. I also pray for you that if you are going through any sickness, that God would miraculously deliver you by the power of his Holy Spirit. Guys, it, it has been said um, that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Um, it it kind of sounds cool, but it's very true. It really is very true. You've got to realize in the first century, they didn't have any scriptures from the New Testament written. And there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. 1,189. Um, 30, 1,103 sentences. And there's one chapter snuck in the Torah. One little chapter that has been so overlooked by the believing community for so long. And there's no chapter like it in the whole Old Testament. Not any. Not any. And I'm talking about Leviticus 23. 44 sentences out of 31,000. That is none other than a blueprint for God's plan of salvation. 44 sentences right smack dab in the Torah that talk about God's plan of redemption. It clearly speaks of Yeshua's first coming, Messiah's first advent, and Yeshua's second coming, Messiah's second advent. There are seven feasts. That is it. Seven. Three are in the spring, which one and two, one we're celebrating right now, and then three are in the fall. The fall feasts are very close together. The spring feasts are a little spread apart, not much. Of course, Passover and first fruits is within three days. And then, of course, you have Shavuot seven weeks later. And um, in the fall, you have Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot in a matter of 15 days. God, as I said, is a God of timing. Yeshua died on Passover. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He rose on the Feast of first fruits. God sent the Torah to be written on our hearts on Shavuot. He is going to come back on Yom Teruah. Jews and Gentiles during the time of the latter part of the tribulation will look upon him and mourn, and he will be their Kippurah on Yom Kippur. They will be inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life. God is going to do a big, full sweeping in the end because God is merciful and wants none to perish. He will take the throne on Sukkot and begin his millennial reign. And that's just the way it is. There is no chapter like it. Oh, 
Shabbat, of course. When is Shabbat? Well, Shabbat's going to happen after the thousand-year reign. And the new heavens come, and the new earth comes, and the new Jerusalem comes, and the Garden of Eden is restored, and sin is no more. And Satan is thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur forever. And then we finally experience a true Shabbat forever, an everlasting Shabbat. Now, um, you might say, how did the Jews miss it? God blinded some of their eyes so the Gentiles could come in. But how did the Gentiles miss it? They have the Bible. You might say, is this just a Jewish thing? I've got to tell you, you know, if you know me, I spoke this to my children, my family yesterday. I am not an arrogant guy. The only thing I'm arrogant is about God's goodness and greatness. I'm arrogant about God's love. I'm arrogant about God's mercy. I'm arrogant about God's grace. That I'm arrogant about. And I make no excuse for it. If you are uncomfortable with me being arrogant about the greatness of God, then I think you have the problem, not moi. But I'm not arrogant about myself, nor yourself. But the fact of the matter is I sat with my kids and I said, guys, I've celebrated Passover my whole life. And we loved it. We had a good time in my house, except for the fact that the Orthodox Haggadah is about three, three and a half hours long. Three and a half hours. Yeah, you didn't eat till like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. It was crazy. But with that being said, we still enjoyed thinking about our history and saying, look at the goodness of God. In Exodus 2, God said, I've heard your cries, and I'm coming to rescue you. I will deliver you with an outstretched arm. Me, not a seraph. Me, not a messenger. Me, not an angel. Me, I heard your cries. I'm going to have an intimate personal relationship with you. I will deliver you from your enemies, your oppressors. So we celebrate. Traditional Judaism, Passover is a wonderful time. They're celebrating. Traditional Christianity, as far as I know, I don't think, except for maybe Catholicism, I don't even think there's a day that they celebrate the death, do they? I think Easter celebrates the resurrection, correct? But there's no celebration, there's no convocation for the death. So, although, if I had to choose between being a traditional Jew and being a traditional Christian, I'd go with Christianity because of Yeshua. However, I said to my kids, we have it. We have the best of both worlds. We have our, our history, our exodus, and we have our Yeshua, our exodus, and we have the exoduses to come. We have it all. It's complete. I will say it again. These are the Lord's feasts. They are not Jewish holidays. In fact, when exodus was implemented in Exodus 12, there really were no Jews. They were the people of Israel, the children of Jacob. They were Hebrews. They were slaves. They were Jews when they went in the land. So you can't even call it a Jewish holiday. My issue is, if Paul, the great apostle, in the greatest theological doctrinal book that we have in the New Testament, Romans, says, you are grafted in, then you have to bear the fruit of what the root is dug into. You can't bear your own fruit. It's impossible. In fact, he says, don't be arrogant. You don't support the root. A branch doesn't support the root. The root supports a branch. So if you're grafted into this tree that has these six feasts, how are you branching off your own feasts? Guys, I know it's been going on for 1,900 years, but I'm sorry. You know what? Who am I, right? I'm just a guy. I'm just Greg, right? Do whatever you want. You're going to anyway. But I'm here to tell you, these are the feasts of the Lord, and I don't care if you're from the south or the north. I don't care if you're rich or poor. I don't care if you're black or white. I don't care if you're educated or uneducated. I don't care if you have excellent etiquette or you're uncouth. If you are grafted into the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then his feasts should be your feasts. And considering the fact that they're memorials, they're signals of what's to come, why would we not celebrate God's feasts when he says, I have seven appointments for you? What? That's it? How many? Check your appointment book for the next year. Tell me how many appointments you have. Tell me. 
Every day you go to work, you have an appointment. You meet with friends, you have an appointment. You go to parties, you have an appointment. You go to a doctor, you have an appointment. Tell me how many appointments. God says, I got seven. And I'm going to show up, God says. And, you know, it would be really nice if you did too. You really shouldn't have to RSVP. Now, am I telling you as a Gentile that you must do these? I'm telling you that you should really look into it and you should really learn how beautiful and magnificent they are. That's what I'm saying. But whether you do or not is not going to change how much I enjoy them and how much I want to keep God's appointments between him and I. Also, on a side note, for some of you Gentile believers, some of you Christians who have come into the Messianic movement, be careful, please, how you share these with your friends and your family. Forgive me, but some of you have done a terrible job of it. You're not to lord these feasts over them. The Jewish people didn't keep Shabbat. Shabbat keeps the Jewish people. I don't keep Pesach. Pesach keeps me. They're gifts from God. So with that being said, the Lord did give detailed instructions to Moses and Aaron how to prepare the Passover. Very detailed. And I'm just going to read for you the first 10 verses. So if you want to follow along at home, we don't have a screen for this. Um, so let's take that first screen off if you wouldn't mind, guys. Okay. I'm going to read from Exodus 12, and you guys just open up your Bible at home. Exodus 12, I'm just going to read ten, the first 10 verses, okay? And you can read along, you can read with your children. And I'm going to take a little sip of water. Excuse me, thank you. I don't know, I spoke to Moshe and Aharon in the land of Egypt. He said, you are to begin your calendar with this month. It will be the first month of the year for you. Speak to all the assembly of Israel and say, on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb or a kid for his family, one per household, except that if the household is too small for a whole lamb or kid, then he and his next door neighbor should share one, dividing it in proportion to the number of people eating it. Your animal must be without defect, a male in its first year, and you may choose it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of the month, and then the entire assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter it at dusk. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the two sides and the top of the doorframe at the entrance of the house in which they eat it. That night, they are to eat the meat roasted in the fire. They are to eat it with matzah and mora. Don't eat it raw or boiled, but roasted in the fire with its head, the lower parts of its legs, and its inner organs. Let nothing of it remain till morning. If any of it does remain, burn it up completely. Is it okay or no? We got to change it? Okay. My, uh, my battery minister is now approaching. It's time to change the battery. Not my battery, the battery on the microphone. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> okay. So we just read Exodus 12, 1 through 10, 10 verses of details that God gave to Moses and Aaron on how to prepare the Passover. They were the, if you will, Moses was the mediator, Aaron was his brother, the high priest, and the two of them were to instruct the children of Israel. They were to hear from God and then tell the people what they heard. So as we always do, because it makes no sense to talk about Scripture without breaking it down. I mean, I just yelled out this morning in my prayer walk, I yelled out, Lord, in these last days, send us teachers, not preachers. We desperately need teachers. It says in the New Testament, Yeshua looked upon the people, and they looked as sheep without a shepherd. And he wept, and he sat down and taught them. 
not preached to them, taught them. Okay, let's look at the first two verses, Exodus 12, 1 through 2. I don't know why the Lord spoke to Moshe, Moses, and Aharon, Aaron, his brother, in the land of Egypt. They were still in Egypt. They weren't uh, released yet from their bondage. He said, quote, you ought to begin your calendar with this month. It will be the first month of the year for you. So, God has a calendar. We have a calendar. It's the Gregorian calendar. And there's nothing wrong with it. We live in America. We follow the Gregorian calendar. Most places in the world do. However, the spiritual part of us should be following God's calendar. And God, like I said, has a calendar. And the first month of his calendar is the month of Nisan, which we are in right now. And today is the 15th of that month. If you notice on certain feasts like Sukkot, Shavuot, and Passover, when everybody was supposed to come together, the moon is always full. God in his goodness and mercy always gave a lot of light during his feasts. If you went outside last night, you would have saw an absolutely stunning moon. A stunning moon. I, uh, I can almost not sleep after I went out to look at it. I just kept staring and staring and thinking about God's goodness. The events of the plagues and the events of the Exodus are so significant, guys, for Israel's identity and our identity that the month they came out of Egypt would become the first month of the year for them because there's a new beginning happening here. Exodus is about newness. Um, so let me say Happy New Year. Exodus 12, 3 through 4 says, Speak to all the assembly of Israel. That means everybody. Everybody. On the 10th day of this month, the 10th of Nisan, each man, it was a job for the priest of the house, is to take a lamb or a kid for his entire family, one per household. Except that if the household is too small, God never wastes, right? Remember when he had the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes and there was left over? He could have just said, ah, leave it. But he said, pick it up. He's a good steward. Then he and his next door neighbor should share one, dividing it in proportion, in proportion. So if, I don't know, if you have six in your family and they had four, you'd get 60% of it and they'd get 40% of it, fair and square, to the number of people eating it. The children of Israel were instructed to choose a lamb on the 10th of Nisan, not the 9th, not the 11th. You might say, why? Because God said so. If I were you, I would stop asking God why. Just as the plague will result in the death of a firstborn in every house of Egypt, Israel is given instructions for a lamb to be sacrificed on behalf of every household in Egypt. It's amazing, really. It's, you know, it's not just death, there's life. It's not just death, there's life. And guess what? They were Egyptians, yes. Egyptians, what we would consider Gentiles, like right? people of nations. They decided to side with the God of Israel. And guess what? They put the blood of the lamb on their doors and they went out with the children of Israel. It says a mixed multitude went out. That means Hebrews and Egyptians. Exodus 12.5 says... Your animal must be without defect. We've gone over this a lot. Um, it means whole. It means innocent. A male in its first year, uh, that means in the prime of its life. Yeshua was in the prime of his life. And you may choose it from either the sheep or the goats. The lamb must be blameless. The lamb must be unblemished. The lamb must be perfect. Exodus 12, 6. You want to keep it until the 14th day. So choose it on the 10th. Keep it till the 14th. And then the entire assembly of Israel will slaughter it at dusk. Keeping the lamb until the 14th of Nisan was for examination purposes. God chose these four days for the children of Israel to examine their lamb to make sure that it was without defect. And then they would slaughter it at dusk. Now, people can get real technical. Um, Jewish believers don't get as technical. I don't know what it is. We're happy to have Yeshua. You guys had Yeshua, but then you're getting caught up in the minutia. You'll lose your mind over, like, is, is Shabbat 636 or 637? I don't know why. I think, I don't, I don't really understand that. Uh, all the Jews I know, they're just, so, they're just so elated to be saved. And you guys are elated to have knowledge. Um, I don't know, but... 
You might say, well, they're slaughtered at dusk. Well, Yeshua wasn't slaughtered at dusk, was he? So, so what happened there, Rabbi? In the original Hebrew, it means between the evenings. Between the evenings, not necessarily what we would think dusk is. And I'll get to that in a little bit, okay? Hang on. Exodus 12, 7. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the two sides and the top of the door, the sides of the door and what's called the lintel, at the entrance of the house in which they eat. Now, most versions, if you read, say put the blood. It's fine, but I don't like that. I like smear. I like smear because smear means to stain. And I'll get into that a little bit later too. The practice of putting the blood on the door would indicate that the members of the household had followed the Lord's instructions. They were obedient. They were obedient. Moses, why are we putting the blood on? Moses, why are we putting it on the top and the sides? Moses, should I put it on the sides first and the top? Why are you asking me so many questions? Just put the blood on the door and go in the house. Okay? And some of you know what I'm talking about because when your kids were little, questions are good. I, I encourage questions. I want my children to ask me questions about God. But when I give them an answer, you know, it's enough. Diana, you know? It was a way that the members of the household had followed the Lord's instructions and was showing we're consecrated onto him. When you're consecrated onto somebody, you're surrendered to them. You're a slave. Just for instance, show me somewhere in the Gospels where Yeshua asked God questions. You want to be a Christian? You want to follow Jesus Christ, right? Stop asking so many questions and just do what he tells you. Okay? Exodus 12, last few verses, 8 through 10 of what we just read. 8 through 10 of Exodus 12 says, That night they are to eat the meat roasted in the fire. They are to eat it with matzah and marah. Don't eat it raw or boiled, but roasted in the fire with its head the lower parts of its legs and its inner organs. Let nothing of it remain till morning. If any of it does remain, burn it up completely. So he's saying eat it with matzah. Matzah is unleavened bread. You know I'm sure you guys are eating matzah. We're supposed to eat matzah for the next seven days of Passover. Moro is bitter herbs and let nothing remain. Completely burn it up. So there are some people out there on the internet, oh God, forgive me, that are saying, well, the only essentials for the Passover is the lamb and, and the mora and the matzah. So when we have the Seder plate, we're really doing something bad. Why? Why? It helps tell the story. The Bible says tell the story to your children. And, 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 and we're using some props to tell the story. What better way to tell the story than with visual things? You're out of your mind. You're being too technical, and you know what? You're causing dissension and division. I tell you, shame on you if you're on the internet teaching that. Shame on you. Does the Bible tell us how many praise songs? Does the Bible tell us we should do praise before worship? Does the Bible tell us that the kids should march around? So am I in violation? Did the Bible tell me to move to Macon? Did the Bible tell me to go to Ethiopia? I don't know. Whenever I read my Bible, it talks about how God spoke to these people. I like to read about what God said to Moses. But I need to know about what God says to Greg. There are three essentials. Yes, you have to have the lamb, you have to have the matzah, and you have to have the bitter herbs. Of course, they point to Yeshua, and I'll get to that in a moment. As a Messianic rabbi, I believe one of my responsibilities is to find Yeshua on the pages of the Torah. Traditional rabbis won't do that. And traditional pastors won't do that. It's my job. It's my job. It's my job to connect the Old Testament and the New Testament to make it a universe, one verse, one Bible, not this big wall between these two testaments. And if you connect the dots, then you'll see the Word of God in high definition. And for any of you who are watching that have been part of Beth Yeshua for any length of time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly. Now, when it comes to finding Yeshua on the pages of the Torah and connecting the Old and New Testaments, Passover is easy pickings. 
You don't even have to be a good Messianic rabbi to see Yeshua in the Passover. <laughs> it's like a no-brainer. So I'm going to give you, make a few points. I don't know, a few points just to chew on, okay? Not that chewing on matzah isn't wonderful, but chew on these points, if you will. Number one, the lamb is, of course, the main attraction of the Passover. The lamb was to take center stage. The lamb was to be the headliner. The spotlight was on the lamb. Why? Because the blood of the slain lamb would be a vivid reminder that a life had to be sacrificed in place of those in the home. At a Seder, every year since we were little, we would take a full glass of wine. Wine represents joy. And we'd fill it to the brim because on Passover we were full of joy. And we would put our pinky in the glass and take out a drop of wine and we would recite the plagues, blood, frogs, lice, cattle disease, and on and on. And, you know, as a young boy, I never asked why we did that. We just always did it. I think like a lot of Christians, why do we celebrate Yeshua's birth on December 20th? We always did it. We, we did the same thing in Judaism. We didn't really ask questions. We, always, we just did it. But as I got old, I thought, why are we doing this? And I found that wine. It's absolutely stunning. Because the, the firstborn in the Egyptian household had to die for the children of Israel to be released. Somebody had to die to bring life. So we pour out a little bit of our joy, remembering about the sacrifice that was made. It's just absolutely stunning to think of. The blood of the slain lamb would remind us that life had to be sacrificed for those in the home. In other words, no lamb, no blood. No blood, no deliverance. It is a no-brainer to see that the lamb is a type and shadow of Yeshua. I'll give you three verses in the New Testament, John, Paul, and Peter, just giants, John 1.29, uh, 1 Corinthians 5.7, and 1 Peter 1.19. The disciple whom Yeshua loved said, he saw Yeshua coming toward him and said, look, he knew the scriptures, man. They were versed. Look, this is way early before anybody called him Messiah. That didn't happen until toward the end of his ministry in Matthew 16, all the way up at Caesarea Philippi. But all right at the beginning, John said he got it from on high, and he said, look, God's Lamb, the one who is taking away the sin of the world. When you know about Passover, when you know about feasts, this made so much sense to these Jewish guys. There wasn't a Gentile among them. No, he received the revelation. And Paul, obviously, post-death post of Yeshua, post-burial, post-resurrection, post-ascension, he said to the people at Corinth, a Pesach lamb, a Passover lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. And he goes on to say, let us keep the feast. The feast of what? The feast of what? The feast of Passover. He said, a Passover lamb, let us keep the feast. Who were the people at Corinth? Were they Jewish? Nope. They were doing the feast. Why not? Why not? Why wouldn't they? What feast would they be doing? Pagan feast? Oh, man. And of course, Peter, the rock, says it was the costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the Messiah as of a lamb without defect. They knew exactly what they were saying. You follow? They knew exactly what they were saying. So, of course, the lamb is a type and shadow of Yeshua. Point number two, the lamb was to be without defect, perfect, unblemished. We have a defect. There is a massive defect in humanity. The massive defect in humanity is our sin nature. It's deplorable. Not sins, our sin nature. That's different. Our sin nature is what gives birth to all sin. Every single solitary sin that we commit comes from our sin nature. That's why Paul said in Romans 12, we need to 
present ourselves as a living sacrifice. We need to burn that sin nature. We can't harness it. You can't put bit and bridle in it. You can't go, whoa. No, no, it won't. It won't. It throws off. It casts off restraint. You know, I'll do what I want. I will do what I want. No, no, you won't do what you want. You're not going to tell me what to do. I will, I will sin because that's what I was made to do. It's my nature. It's human nature. It's natural to us. So what do we have to do? We got to get a hold of something supernatural. We got to get the Holy Spirit, man. The Holy Spirit's supernatural. The, nothing the Holy Spirit does is sinful. Everything the Holy Spirit does is righteous. So what do I need to do? I got to get rid of my sin nature and get more of this supernatural nature. That's what matzah is about. What do you think matzah is about? Just eat it till you're constipated? Matzah has got nothing to do with that. It has to do with getting the leaven out of our lives. You're not righteous because you eat matzah. You think you're eating matzah and your, your, your cousin's eating bread during this week and all of a sudden you're, you're impressing God? Are you a fool? You are. All these things, kashrut, eating kosher, isn't just about food. It's not about nutrition. It's about separation. The defect in humanity is our sin nature. But if you were going to complain, if you were going to claim to be the Messiah, if somebody was going to come along, let's say, in the first century and say, hey, hey, guys, what's up? I'm the Messiah. Oh, yeah? You are? Is that right? You would have to be without defect. Because if you had any defect, if you had a human defect, if you had human nature, a natural, if you were just a natural man, you couldn't be the Messiah because you would sin. There's no way around it. Sin nature gives birth to sin. But the Bible says something different. Paul and Peter and John again says something different. Look at Hebrews 4.15, 1 Peter 2.22, and 1 John 3.5. Hebrews 4.15 says, In every aspect he, Yeshua, was tempted, just as we are. You know what the difference is? He didn't sin. That's the difference. That's a big difference. Oh, there's just a little difference between me and Yeshua. No, there's a big difference. You see, your God is his father. His father impregnated Miriam. I'm a product of, of a natural man and a natural woman. I'm all natural, man. He was supernatural. And he did not decrease when he came to the earth, as some people think. Well, well, he gave up his power, and he just became like us. No, he took on flesh. It wasn't subtraction, it was addition. Addition. Peter says, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found on his lips. And John says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins and that there is no sin in him. I hope somebody that is watching at home just yelled hallelujah. Point number three. They were to choose the lamb on the 10th of Nisan. We just read that in Exodus 12, right? You remember? And inspect it for four days for imperfections, to make sure it was without defect. And then they were to slaughter it on the 14th, as the original Hebrew puts it, between the evenings. So first of all, between the evenings of the 14th of Nisan and the 15th of Nisan would be about 9 a.m. on the 14th of Nisan. About 9 a.m., Dusk to dusk, night to night, right in the middle, would be about nine. Question, do you know anyone who was slain for the sins of the world, oh, about 2,000 years ago? About 9 a.m. on Nisan 14? I do. I do. Let's take a closer look without getting too technical. I'm going to make this real easy for you because... Once you start getting involved in dates and times, your brain starts to fry, you start to overanalyze, and you walk out more confused than when you came in. And that's exactly what Satan wants. If you study this stuff and you're more confused, you're playing into Satan's hands. He's the author of confusion, not my father. Let's take a look at John 12.1. This is what the Bible says, not somebody on a website. It says six days before Pesach, 
before Passover, Yeshua came to Bet Anya. Bet Anya is Bethany. It was two miles east of Jerusalem. Where Eleazar, Lazarus, lived, the man Yeshua had raised from the dead. So six days before the Passover, Yeshua went to Bethany to the house of his friends whenever he came to, to Jerusalem. It's like if I had a good friend from Florida that was going to Atlanta, they'd probably stop and make it and say hello. He went to his friend's house, Miriam, Martha, and Eleazar, for a special dinner, a special dinner in his honor. Six days before Nisan 14 is Nisan 8, period. Period, basic math, okay? John 12, 12, it says later on in that chapter, the next day, the large crowd that had come for the festival, Passover, heard that Yeshua was on his way into Jerusalem, okay? The next day, he comes six days before the Passover to Bethany, and then it says in the same chapter, the next day. The next day is the next day. So if he came Nisan 8, what's the next day? Nisan 9, or the 9th of Nisan, right? This isn't hard. It's the next day. A five-year-old can know that, you know? Today, today, honey, today is Thursday. What's the next day? Friday, Daddy? Yep. Yep. The next day. So, the next day Yeshua came into Jerusalem on the 9th. But he did not subject himself to criticism or inspection from the religious leaders on Nisan 9. This is important because you might say, wait a minute, Rabbi. The scriptures say, Nisan 10, you're supposed to hold it for four days and inspect it. That's exactly what I said because that's what the Bible said. They didn't inspect him yet, right? Nope. Let's look further. We have to compare these gospels a little bit. Okay, gospel means synoptic. They're synoptic, seen through the same eyes. Okay, Mark 11.11 says, Yeshua entered Jerusalem the next day, Nisan 9, went into the temple courts, took a good look at everything, but since it was now late, he went out with the 12. It's it's very late in the day, and he goes back to the 12 to Bethania. That's where he's staying. He's staying two miles east on Passover. You have to find a place to stay because all the pilgrims come for this festival all over the diaspora. All Jews have to come. The three festivals, Deuteronomy 16, 16. So on... Nisan 9, Yeshua looked around at the center of religious Jewish life, the temple courts, to see if it was fulfilling its purpose. He's inspecting the courts. The courts aren't expecting him. Guys, Yeshua is not on trial. You are. You are. And he's looking around and he's saying, hmm, is, is, this, is this really fulfilling its purpose? Leading people? to the true worship of God? Is this the way it's supposed to be? What do you think I do sometimes when I hear about some new wave aftershave church that's not preaching the gospel and talking about sin and death, and I make a comment, you go, who are you? Who am I? I'm a watchman. God told me to make a comment. That's who I am. Maybe if more people made comments, people wouldn't be hoodwinked by garbage. He enters the courts, but he did not cleanse the temple. Nisan 9. If he did cleanse the temple on Nisan 9 and they started criticizing him, then he would have had been inspected for five days, Nisan 9 to 14, instead of four days per God's instruction in Exodus 12. Uh Uh-uh, he ain't going off script. Uh Uh-uh, no. Nope. So we're still on Nisan 9, right? Now let's look at the next verse in the same gospel account, Mark 11. The next day, so it's Nisan 9. What's the next day? Nisan 10. Right? Are we following it? We're good? See all the crazies? See all the nuttiness? I'm, I'm a simpleton, and I know most people are, so I'm, I'm making it simple for all the simpletons, okay? I'm sorry to all the scholars out there who I'm not making it complicated enough for you. The next day on reaching Jerusalem, so he went back, Nisan 9, to Bethany, and then the next day, Nisan 10, he comes into Jerusalem. In theological circles, it's known as the triumphant entry, where they put the palm branches down. He enters the temple courts, and you would think, oh, look, could this be the Messiah? He's coming to the temple. This is going to be great. Not exactly. No. And he began driving out those who were carrying on business there, both the merchants and their customers. Now, were you supposed to bring a sacrifice on Passover? Yeah. Yeah. Can you carry, if you were coming from far away, your sacrifice on your shoulders? No. 
So, so did, you, did you have some money to exchange from your, local, from your locale? To exchange money to get a sacrifice? Yes. W- were, they, were, they, were they being fair in their foreign exchange rates? No more than we are fair today. I travel all over the world, and they always try to rip me off. So I tell people when you travel, use your credit card because your bank is going to give you the best exchange rate. Same thing, money changes, money changes. They're just looking to make the most money they can. And the money changes and the tax collectors were working for Rome, and Rome said, look, this is the piece I want. Anything more than you get? You know what I'm saying? Be like if I, uh, I don't know, if I was a serviceman, I was a plumber, and I had a bunch of plumbers working for me and go, look, what I, what I want you to charge is 100 bucks. If you want to charge 150 I make 50 for yourself on the side. That's fine. You follow? That's, nothing's changed, guys. Greed is greed. Nothing's changed. Human nature is human nature. Nothing's new. Nothing's new under the sun. Nothing's new under the sun. He also knocked over the desk. Oh, Yeshua knocked over desks? I don't. The only Yeshua I know is the one who sits in Starbucks drinking a latte and playing a guitar and singing Chris Tomlin songs. I don't know any Jesus that knocks over desks or makes a whip. Whatever it takes to snatch people out of the fire. Whatever it takes. He knocked over the desks of the money changers, upset the benches of the pigeon dealers, and refused to let anyone carry merchandise through the temple courts. Man, he came in strong. He came in strong. Then he sat down and taught them. He didn't preach. He taught, taught, taught. And he said, right from the Tanakh, the Tanakh is an acronym. It's an acronym for the Torah, the Nevim, and the Ketuvim, which is basically the first five books, the prophets, and the writings, the Old Testament. It's an acronym for the Old Testament. He said, isn't it written in the, you know, he's asking a question, but it's rhetorical. He knows what's written. He's the word of God. Isn't it written in the Tanakh, my house? You notice he said my house? Will be called the house of prayer for all the goyim. You know what? There was a court of Gentiles. There was a middle wall. And Gentiles were allowed in the temple. But guess what? There were so many money changes that they were taking up the space so the Gentiles couldn't get in to pray. How about that? And then the neat thing was that wall came down, didn't it? Yes. Yeshua took the wall down, and the Jew and the Gentile became one in Messiah. Now what do we have today? The wall's built back. It's back. Yes, Satan built it back. Yes. Yes. He panicked after the first century. Yeshua's prayer in John 17 was coming to fruition. He panicked. He had an emergency demonic meeting. He got all his top demons And he said, we need to rebuild that wall. Satan, what do we do, they asked. It's easy. Give give the Gentiles different feasts. Tell the the Messianic Jews they do Passover and first fruits and Sukkot. Tell the Gentiles they do something called Christmas and Easter. Tell the Jews they can't eat a couple of things. Tell the Gentiles they're free to eat whatever they want. Tell the Jews to worship on Shabbat. You've got to keep the fourth command. Tell the Gentiles fourth command is not important anymore. Brick by brick. And what does a good Messianic Jew do? Tear down the wall. Brick by brick. You have made my father's house a den, a place of thieves. The head Kohanim, that's the priests, not the Levites. Levites are a different sect of the priesthood. The head Kohanim, the Torah teachers, the one that was responsible for explaining the Torah of God, heard what he said. They heard, they saw, they were there. Can you imagine? Nobody laid a hand on him. Why didn't they? Why didn't they just arrest him? They have temple guards. Who is he? Who is this, who is this man from Nazareth? What good could come out of Nazareth? It was the hood of Israel. Who is he to knock over? Who? They couldn't touch him. One, because God didn't let him. What God says goes. And two, because they knew deep down he was right. They had turned the temple into a den of thieves, a holy place. They tried to find a way to do away with him. They were afraid of him. 
They were afraid of him. It's not like he was, he wasn't Samson. He wasn't statuesque. Isaiah 53 says he was nobody to look at. Nope, no big deal. They were afraid because the crowds were utterly taken by his teaching. He taught with an authority. The Holy Spirit breathed on everything he said. And he taught with an authority. And when he taught, the people had two choices to make. Either kill him or change. And a lot of people were changing. When evening came, they left the city. So, Mark is telling us that the next day, Nisan 10, he came into Jerusalem, just like it says in Exodus 12. And he began to literally clean house. And Yeshua was bold and authoritative in his judgment. They had the opportunity. They had the opportunity to purify themselves. But because of fear of losing social status and economic status and political power, they instead sought ways to destroy the purifier instead of being purified themselves. He was then questioned and examined, just like it says in Exodus 12. And tested by the head Kohanim, the Torah teachers, the scribes, the elders. They questioned him, but they had nothing on him. It was like God was telling the children of Israel, you guys got your lamb, and I've got mine. Inspect him, go ahead. Tell me if you see any guile in him. Number four, the flesh of the lamb was to be roasted in the fire, picturing Messiah's ending God's wrath against our sins forever. Matzah and moral were to be eaten with it, which speaks of Yeshua's sinless life, the matzah. And although he was sinless, his life was embittered, the mora. Look at Exodus 12, 46. It is to be eaten in one house. You are not to take any of the meat outside the house, and you are not to break any of its bones. Not a bone was to be broken on the Passover lamb. Beautifully fulfilled in John 19. He's hanging on the cross now. It's Nisan 14. That's yesterday. Sundown yesterday starts Nisan 15. That's the high Sabbath, and we're supposed to congregate. you got to get him off the cross. He can't hang on the cross on a high Sabbath. So what do they do? You die of asphyxiation and hypovolemic shock, rapid heartbeat, and not enough air in the lungs. But if they still were breathing, they had to break the legs because they would push themselves up. If you break the kneecaps, you can't mobilize the bones in your legs to take in a breath. So they got to the first criminal and the second criminal, and they were still breathing, so they broke the legs. When they got to Yeshua, what happened? They didn't break his legs. He was already dead. Look at Exodus 19. I mean, uh, John 19. It says, but when they got to Yeshua, it's so important why this is in there. They saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. For these things happened in order to fulfill this every single prophecy about Yeshua. 333 prophetic messengers had to be fulfilled for him to claim to be Mashiach. Not one of his bones will be broken. Do you know that I've asked several surgeons, exceptional surgeons, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about the spear? The soldier was, you know the soldier was frustrated? Do you know why he stuck him with a spear? He was frustrated. Why is he frustrated? Because he's a guy that likes to, likes to hurt people. That's what they do. They get psychopaths. They get experts in torturing people. Experts at torture. And he loves to break a guy's legs and, and just put him out of his ministry. M misery. It feels so good. You know, just break his legs, man. And when he got to Yeshua, he was already dead. And he's like, oh, man, and frustration. Now, what did the spear look like? It was six foot long. If you shove a spear right in between the ribs, you will hit the lungs, which are filled with blood and water, even in the pericardium sac. Still, that spear didn't break any bones. Not one. Number five. Let's take a look at Exodus 12, 15. 
For seven days you were to eat matzah. That means after Nisan 14, for seven days, still part of the Passover feast, even though people think unleavened bread is its separate thing. No, it's part of Passover. Hag matzah. Eat matzah on the first day. Remove the leaven from your houses. Whoever eats chametz, leaven, from the first to the seventh is to be cut off from Israel. The children of Israel were commanded to eat matzah for seven days. Thus reminding them of the speed of their exodus. But since we know that leaven speaks of sin, they were really being reminded that those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb should leave sin in the world behind them. Hello? We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So what should we do? Leave sin and the world behind us. It's spelled out beautifully by Paul to the people of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5. Three verses, six word. He says, don't you know the saying? It was a saying amongst the Jewish people. It, it takes only a little leaven, a little chametz, to leaven a whole batch of dough. Get rid of the old chametz. Get rid of it so that you can be a new batch of dough. Newness of life. First fruits. Newness of life. What do you get baptized for? To come out? Newness of life. Because in reality, you are unleavened. You sit in heavenly places. For our Passover lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. It already happened. So let us celebrate the Seder. Let us celebrate the Passover. Rabbi, do we really have to? Oh, you know what? Just, you know what? Go, go paint some eggs. What, what do you want from me? Not with leftover chametz, the chametz of wickedness and evil, but with the mats of purity and truth. They're not talking about yeast here, guys. It's not yeast. Leaven is not yeast. It's fermented dough. Fermented dough. What they would do is they would take a little bit of the fermented dough out and keep it aside and keep it cool the week prior, and then the next week when they made the challah, they would just insert it. Insert the little bit, the little bit of leavened dough into a brand new lump of dough to make it rise. Just a little. If sin in the church is not dealt with, it will silently spread its destructive consequences throughout the whole fellowship like a virus. Like a virus. Today, Church discipline doesn't exist. It's a free-for-all. Free-for-all. As I told you earlier, the lamb takes center stage. The spotlight is on the lamb because without the lamb, there would be no blood. Without the blood, there would be no deliverance. Let's take a look back to Exodus 12 for a minute, 23rd verse. It says, for Adonai will pass through to kill the Egyptians. What? I thought, I thought, yeah, you thought wrong. Adonai is killing the Egyptians. What? Sorry. I just know God is a God of love. Well, he, well, he okay, okay, I get it. All right, so he killed people in the Old Testament, but the New Testament, nope. Because he loves everybody. See, that's what everybody wants to do now with this virus. Let's all come together, Christians and Jews and, and Muslims and, and secular people, and let's sing We Are the World like Michael Jackson wanted, and we'll all get along. And they'll all go to hell singing We Are the World. First of all, I don't want to be the world. <laughs> I want to be the kingdom. That's number one. But besides that, and I hear even on Christian radio stations, we will combat this. We will do it together. You're a Christian radio station. You're promoting the spirit of humanism? You're promoting the resiliency of the human spirit? Pray. Beg God for deliverance. It's a pestilence. I don't know who will pass through to kill the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the top and the two sides, I don't know who will pass over. Pass over. See? The door. So he's going to go house to house. The slaughter of the angel of death works for him. 
Come on, follow me. Got the blood, Passover. Got the blood, Passover. Got the blood, Passover. Uh, uh, missing the blood. Go in. Kill him. Got the blood, Passover. Got the blood, Passover. Uh, 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 uh. No blood. Sorry. Yeah, but I did some nice things. Yeah, you did a lot of nice things too. I listened to you a couple of times. Yeah, you didn't listen to me a lot of times. Why am I smiling? Because it's serious, man. It's serious. When he sees the blood, it says, when he sees the blood, see, but when he, he is God, the Lord will pass over and not permit the death angel to enter your house. The blood was placed on the doorway of the houses of Israel, and it was to function as a sign that they were part of the Lord's people, also as a seal to appropriate the Lord's protection from the plague. It's a sign. The feasts are a sign. The feasts are a rehearsal of what's to be. A sign, a directive. And when God saw the sign, he's like, they're good. They're good. They're sealed. They're protected. But if the children of Israel didn't go through the door, so they put the blood on the door, and if they would have stayed outside, they would have died. It says you got to go in the house. you got to go in the house, meaning through the door. If they stayed outside, they were dead as a doornail. Spiritually speaking, who's the door? It's a no-brainer. Yeshua said in John 10, 9, I am the door. I am the door. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to hold on to the door? Um, I know this sounds a little like semantics, but no. No, we're supposed to go through the door. Go through Yeshua to what? To the Father, into the kingdom. Get out of the world and go into the kingdom. Yeshua said, I've come so you will know me. He said, I've come so you will know the Father. Where we can boldly go through the door, come into his throne room and say, Abba. It doesn't mean that you forget about Yeshua. It doesn't mean you put Yeshua on a lower level. He's part of the Godhead for sure, but you go through Yeshua. Who do we pray to, Rabbi? It's easy. They asked Yeshua the same thing 2,000 years ago. And he said what? Our Father. We are immersed when we go through the door we are immersed into Yeshua's sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins, and figuratively, his blood falls on the lintel and doorpost of our heart. And when we pass, God will see the blood, and therefore his angel of death has to pass over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just a few more verses. It's not like you have anywhere to go. Exodus 12, 48. It says, if a foreigner, what? A foreigner? Who's the foreigner? The non-Hebrew. Today it would be the non-Jew. If a foreigner is staying with you, staying with us, yeah. Foreigners put the blood on the door. They wanted to be part of the nation of Israel. They left with a mixed multitude. For all intents and purposes, they became Jews, if you will. If they want to observe the Lord's pa whose Passover is it? The Lord's. What? No, it's it's it belongs to the Jews. It belongs to Christian. Nope. It's the Lord's. His Passover. He's passing over you, and not letting the angel of death come in, the destroyer, the slaughterer. If a foreigner staying with you wants to observe. That's what, what do I have here? I have Gentiles, foreigners basically come to me and say, Rabbi, can we observe? Of course you can. And don't call yourself a Gentile anymore. We're one, brother. Come on. Let's celebrate together. Jew and Gentile, one and Messiah. That's what we have at Beth Yeshua. 
That's the right approach. I want to, not do I have to. That's the right approach, foreigner. Do I have to? You don't have to do nothing, man. God says everything is permissible. Not everything's beneficial, but every, knock yourself out. Do whatever you want. You're going to anyway. But when somebody comes to me and says, Rabbi, I want to. Man, now I got something to work with here. You think it's hard to find a good teacher? Some of you are like, well, Rabbi Greg's a pretty good teacher. I, I'm, it's very hard to find a good teacher. Let me tell you something. It's very, very hard to find a good student. Show me somebody who's digging into the scriptures and studying words and hungry. You know how many people I come across like that? All his males must be circumcised. What? What are we talking about here? I thought they didn't have to be circumcised. Acts 15 said they don't have to be. Those are Judaizers. Then, after he circumcised all the males, he may take part and observe it. He will be like a citizen of Israel. (gasps) Romans, you're grafted into the commonwealth. You become a citizen of (sighs) it. But no uncircumcised person is to eat of it. Rabbi, are you saying that today if you're a born-again believer? And you're a Gentile and you haven't been circumcised, you can't eat of the Passover? No, I'm not saying that. This is Acts 12. No, I'm not saying that at all. Participation in the feasts back then required that a person be identified as part of the Lord's people, which is no different today. Only those who were willing to be consecrated. Circumcision didn't make you holy. No. It was something that God was trying to teach that you've got to cut away the flesh cut away the natural man, cut away the ways of the world. That's what he was teaching. He was teaching about a circumcised heart. So only those who are willing to be consecrated onto the Lord in covenant commitment. You can't come up and say a prayer if you don't want to have covenant commitment. What does that mean? What does that mean? Only those who wanted to partake in a covenant, in a relationship with God, could partake of the Passover could have the angel of death pass over them. Only for them could it bear its full meaning. Guys, it is insidious today to me. Rabbi Greg, are you still a sinner? Yeah, I still have a sin nature. I'm doing everything I can to kill it because it's miserable. But it is insidious to me how lukewarm and how much greasy grace is being paved on the road to hell. I hear people declaring all the time, it's almost like they're glorifying their sinfulness. They say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and God knows, and God's got it covered. All I know is, Jesus lives in my heart. Well, I got news for you. Yes, we are sinners saved by grace. But when we go through the door of Yeshua, we enter into God's house. And it is there that the potter master starts to mold and reshape the clay. And that's called the sanctification process. And it's absolutely stunning. We have to be born again. We have to have a circumcised heart. And once we get that circumcised heart, a new heart does new stuff. In other words, I know there's a very famous song that they sing in Christianity when they're giving an evangelistic cry, it's come as you are, right? I think that's what it's called. God always tells me, come as you are, but don't leave as you came. That would be horrific. I think J. Hudson Taylor said it best, really. The entry fee into the kingdom of God is free. The annual dues will cost you everything. Okay, Rabbi, great. So you're telling me we repent, we say to God, we're sorry for all that we've done. We're sorry of what it cost you on the cross. It's my fault. Guilty as charged. I want to be immersed. I want the blood to be on the doorpost and lintel of my heart. But how am I going to walk this out? What what changes, Rabbi? I mean, okay. Okay, the laws are on my heart. I need something. I need something. I prayed. I believe. I need something. Give me something to fight. I can't fight on my own. So how do we do it, Rabbi? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to answer that, and it has to do with the great importance of Yeshua's ascension, something that we, I think, just, you know, we talk about the cross all the time. We talk about his resurrection all the time. Uh, Sometimes we talk about his return, but we don't talk much about the ascension, right? Not much. It's like, all right, whatever. We'll get him back here. The ascension's huge. 
Huge. I'll show you. John 20, verses 10 through 17. This is after Yeshua has resurrected and Miriam of Magdala goes to the tomb to prepare the body for burial. They go. The body's gone. The disciples that went with her, they went home. But Miriam stood outside crying. As she cried, she bent down. She peered into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Yeshua had been. One at the head and one at the feet. Why are you crying, they asked her. The angels are talking to her. They took my Lord, she said to them. Now she's crying profusely. She's not crying. I mean, it's, it's early in the morning. When did he resurrect? I would say, I would say that he resurrected on the first day of the week because that's what the Bible says. What, what time would you say, Rabbi? Like when we have sunrise services? Nope. No way. Why, Rabbi? He said three days and three nights. In Jewish reckoning, any part of a day is a night and a day. It's not necessarily a 24-hour period. But he had a rise first thing Sunday. When's first thing Sunday? Saturday night at sundown. Why, why wouldn't God, what? God wouldn't leave him dead in that musty tomb not one more minute than he had to. He's going to rest on Shabbat, but he's going to rise after Shabbat. And she went there early in the morning. How early? You think she went there 7, 8? No. Maybe 3 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock. She finished Shabbat. She got the spices together, and she went there. And it's dark. There's no lights. She's crying, and she's got mucus running down her face, and she can't see. They took my Lord, she said to them, and I don't know where they've put him. Where, 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 who took him? Where is he? You must know. Clearly, you're part of the angelic host. Where is he? She said this, and she turned around and saw Yeshua standing there, but she didn't know who he was. Again, it's dark. She's not seen clearly. Plus, he's a little bit more glorified. He's in a resurrected state. So I think he looked a tad different. He was a person, surely, but different. Turns around, sees Yeshua, but she didn't know who he was. Yeshua said to a lady, why are you crying? Whom are you looking for? Because she's going crazy. Thinking he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you're the one who carried him away, meaning you're taking care of this area, okay, if you're the one who carried no harm, no foul, just tell me where you put him. I'll go get him myself. Maybe you threw him off to the side. I don't know where you put him, but wherever you put him, tell me, because... Yeah, he's my friend, my best friend, and, and I'd like to give him a proper burial if that's okay. Let's continue. Yeshua said to her, Miriam, turning, she cried out to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher, and she just dove at him. You know what I'm saying? Once she realized it's Yeshua, you don't think, you, you react. She dove and grabbed onto him, probably grabbed onto his waist and, and fell, just fell at his feet. And holding on to him, almost where he's almost losing his balance. And what does he say? Stop holding on to me. I haven't yet gone back to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them I am going back to my Father and your Father, Miriam, to my God. and your God. In that section, guys, I love that it says the disciples went home, but Miriam. But Miriam. The other two disciples, they went home, but Miriam, she shows her great love and devotion, thinking that the body was stolen, so she stays outside the tomb just weeping. They were fine. They left. They went home. I'm tired. It's two in the morning. I'm going to go home and get some sleep, you know? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'd like to read the Bible, but I need to sleep a full eight hours. You're pathetic. You're pathetic. You love God so much, but you can't give him 15 minutes of your time? Hmm. Only those, only those who love the Lord, like a Joshua, who once Moses was finished talking to God, remember? 
Who knows how long he was in there for? Was he in there for 20 minutes? Was he in there for 20 hours? I don't know. But when Moses would be done and come out of the tent of meeting, he'd say, Josh, come on, his understudy, come on. And Joshua would say, Moses, if it's okay, can I stay? You're going to just stay outside the tent of meeting? Why did he stay? I don't know. Maybe he thought that just one day God would say, Josh, come in. Come in, Josh. And he was willing to wait on the Lord. She did not realize that Yeshua had risen, and she cries out, Rabbani. She was still thinking of him as the great teacher she had known. Miriam had not known Yeshua, had known Yeshua personally as a man, not as Messiah. She had seen miracles happen when he was with her. She thought that if Yeshua was not with her in bodily form, she could have no hope of blessing. So the Lord needed to gingerly correct her thinking as well as her understanding. Basically, Miriam, he says, I have to return to heaven. I have to. But when I do, there's a reason for my ascension. I will send the Ruach HaKodesh down to you, to all those who have repented of their sins. All those who have been immersed into my sacrifice for the forgiveness of their sins. I'll send them the Ruach. And when the Ruach comes, he will reveal me to your heart in a way you have never known me before. What? Yes, I will be nearer and dearer to you than was possible while I was here on earth. This is why the ascension of Yeshua is so vital for God to be able to conform us into the image of his son. Charles Finney was the greatest evangelist we had. He said it beautifully. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, rather, is that God in the New Covenant gives us a power to walk out what the Old Covenant requested but didn't give us the power to do. The Ten Commandments hasn't changed, but now we have the power. And Satan has a power. But if you want to fight the power of Satan, you need the power of God to fight. Desperately. Desperately need the power to fight. Okay. Let's bring this to a close. And, and just for the record, before I close with four verses of Scripture, again, if you are watching... I need to let you know we had two more salvations this week. One person from Seattle who happened to be watching on, on an Instagram feed. He doesn't even know we exist. And he gave his life to the Lord. Now, now let me tell you why it's legitimate to me. Why sometimes when you ask a five-year-old if they want to come up and avoid going to hell, why they come up a five-year-old. Who wouldn't? Let me read to you what he wrote to us at Beth Yeshua. He doesn't know I'm reading this, but I'm not giving the name anyway. He says, Shalom, my name is, and I'm writing from Seattle, Washington. I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and it's been a struggle, but I wasn't born again until today. And I received the Holy Spirit and the message that Rabbi Greg Hirschberg gave that I saw in an Instagram video. And he said to write, so I'm writing, I feel the joy that I've never felt before, and I just want to say thank you. The peace that I am experiencing right now is all that I've ever longed for. My soul is beyond content. I know that the road ahead will be difficult, but I believe that I can trust in your sound doctrine. I feel great zeal for God, and I want to maintain that through all circumstances. That's being born again. And also a young lady. So guess what? Even though the coronavirus has caused people to lose their mind, we have 10 new souls in the kingdom. Ten. And it's not going to stop there. Oh, no. No, no. We're just getting started. So again, if you're sitting there and you've never been born again, it's, it's not difficult. If you feel terrible about what you've done, good. You feel guilty, good. That will bring you to the door of confession. Confess it to God. Tell him you want to be forgiven. He wants to forgive you. Tell him you want to be washed in the blood of Yeshua's sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins. Tell him to stain your heart with his blood. 
tell him you want the Holy Spirit because you desperately want to walk this out. And I got news for you. He won't forsake you or leave you ever, period. End of story. If you have done that, you need to call because I want to get you a Bible. I want to give you my book. I want to get you CDs and DVDs. Right now, um, we have um, Regina is kind enough to work on a project for me. I want to put together two series, one series for the lost and one series for the saved. I want to put together an evangelistic series, and I want to put together um, a discipleship series, small and simple, something that we could send out. How much is it going to cost? Nothing. I want to just make it available to anybody who wants it. We're in the process of doing that. She's in the process of trying to find messages that would work. This might be one of them. Saturday might be one of them. I don't know. But it's not going to be 42 hours of discipleship. It's not going to be a Bible college. But it's going to be enough to hit on the strong points to keep you straight. And that's what we're trying to do right now. Last but not least, Yeshua gave us fair warning that things were going to quake and shake and then shake and bake prior to his return. And I'm not talking about this coronavirus. <laughs> it's nothing. Right now, 79% of, uh, of all pastors in America across the board, from Catholic to charismatic, believe that we are absolutely in days. 79% said they believe they'll see Yeshua in their lifetime. Things are changing, guys. It hasn't been like this for a long time. The 50s, the 60s, no. Nobody looked at Yeshua's return. In the 70s and 80s, there was a couple of people that did, and they were thought to be nuts. They're not nuts anymore. Look what Yeshua says about the end days in Luke 21. Verses 25, 26, he says, There will appear signs in the sun, in the moon and in the stars, and on earth. Nations will be in anxiety and bewilderment at the sound and surge of the sea, as people faint with fear at the prospect of what has overtaken the world. For the powers in heaven will be shaken. These verses are not figurative. <laughs> They describe the convulsions of nature and the cataclysms on the earth that will precede Yeshua's second advent. There will be disturbances involving the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they will be clearly seen on planet earth. Heavenly bodies will be moved out of their orbit. There will be great tidal waves sweeping across land areas. This, my friends, will be far greater than any virus. In fact, it will make corona look like child's play. Therefore, because of it, panic. Do you see panic? I'm watching my friends, believers, panic-stricken. Rabbi, are you saying we shouldn't take precautions? Buddy, I'm telling you to look both ways when you cross the street and look behind you when you're getting into a car at a mall. But I'm not telling you to be panicked. That's a sad state of reality. That's a sad state of affairs. Panic will seize mankind because of this heavenly collision course with the earth. But, and I say but, 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 there is great hope for the godly. There is great hope for the godly. In the first century, they were persecuted. Where it started, it's coming back. Too much is given, much is required. But they didn't panic. They sang the prison doors open. Last two verses, and then with Gonzo Alonzo. 27, 28 of Luke 21. So we see the cataclysms. But then they, the believers, the godly, will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with tremendous power, tremendous glory, when these things start to happen, the birth pangs, when they start, when the earth starts to go into labor, when the heavens start to go into labor, stand up, hold your heads high, because you are about to be liberated for us, for the believer, for the believer, if that's who you are. You can't just be a believer in times of prosperity, in times when the doctor says, oh, the report's negative. When you thought it was positive, oh, oh, it's negative, oh, hallelujah. Yeah. For us, our posture should be one of hope and confidence. In fact, we should be elated and joyful. Why? It's the consummation of all things. It's all that we've been waiting for. 
From the time I got saved, I was looking at the eastern sky daily. For Yeshua returns not as a mere baby in a manger or as a mere man mangled on an execution stake, but as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Therefore, for us believers, we don't lie down and hang our heads. No, not us. We stand tall with our heads held high. And you know why? Because all that our hearts have longed for is coming to pass finally. So guys, when you see the world's kingdoms falling apart, it means God's kingdom is coming together. So look up, I tell you. Look up. Because we are finally about to be liberated. Hallelujah. Chag Sameach. Happy Passover. I'll see you guys Saturday morning. Shalom.